Got it. Hi, Josh, so-called Dolgan. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me. So I, um, boy, you're one of these people, like I'm going to try to describe you to people who don't know who you are. Let's see. Pianist, accordionist, rapper, producer, filmmaker, puppet maker, magician, singer, composer. <laughs> um, I would say like artistic magnet, like you bring all these people and genres together. What, what have I missed there? Uh, I mean, it's a funny question these days because like it's been two years of basically being sitting in this room. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so I forget what I did or what I am or what I was supposed to be doing or something, but I've been, but yeah, that was a very good start. I'm basically, I'm, I have a lot of hobbies and a lot of, uh, interests and passions and and yes i do like to bring people together uh and sort of bring the different passions together yeah so let's start with curried soul remix oh <laughs> so any canadians listening will probably be very uh familiar with the as it happens theme originally mo kaufman 1969 if i'm right mm -hmm. and, and you were commissioned to remix this yes well actually it started out off as a competition okay where they asked a bunch of producers mm -hmm. to take this like hallowed piece of canadian culture because really like why mess with it it's like this perfect uh i mean it's a beautiful song but it's also just the perfect package with that show as it happens and that sound and it's just like i grew up with it like like all canadians like every single day hearing that awesome uh, tune and so the CBC has a way of trying to sort of, you know, be hip and try to stay <laughs> relevant or something. And so they think, hey, let's mess with that. Let's uh, let's get let's let's spruce it up. <clears throat> so they asked a bunch of producers to like deal with the material and see if they could come up with something. Uh, and they only really gave us like the the track. There, they didn't, <clears throat> there was no multi-track recording or, or like whatever. We just got the raw track. I think it was even just an MP3. I'm not even sure it was a wave file. And so they gave it to a bunch of producers and they said, do something. Um, so I went to, actually, it's a studio in Ottawa that I <clears throat> do all my work out of. Well, I used to before <laughs> the end of the world. Uh, this this family of, of producers with the name of Bova. And there's Phil Senior, and then there's Phil Junior. And I started working with Phil Senior, and then I, I continued to work with both of them. Uh, and so I went to Phil Junior's studio, and we started messing around with the track. And I came up with a thing, and CBC loved it. So they asked me to eventually to actually finish what I'd started. Mm -hmm. And so that's been on the radio for about <clears throat> nine years now, actually. Three times a day, you hear my version of the Mo Kaufman <laughs> Curried Soul as the theme song, which is an honor and super cool. And I love hearing it when I turn on the radio, but I'm also mad because between you and me and your listeners, uh, the only reason that the, the Kaufman estate agreed to it uh, would be to, to, to retain all the uh, publishing. <clears throat> so I got paid a little bit to do the work and I never saw another penny and it's been heard, I don't know, t millions of times. Yeah. Uh, and what people hear isn't Mo Kaufman anymore. It's a lot of my work and it's actually me playing flute on the keyboard. And it's like, I, I replayed everything and the beats are all new and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a little weird that, <laughs> that, that me as the living musician whose work is heard every single day on the CBC across the country, I don't get any anything for from it other than the great satisfaction of knowing that <laughs> that I did something cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this kind of brings to like the when you got involved with sampling and stuff. But actually, Mo Kaufman, he was a cool guy. Like I was looking him up because this was a theme I'd heard and I never really thought like who was this guy? What was his background? Right. Quite Super cool. I actually have a somewhere in this room. I'm in my childhood bedroom, by the way, <laughs> where I've been for two two and a half years. Uh, and somewhere in it is a signed ticket of Mo Kaufman. 
that I went to see when I was in high school. Our our high school jazz band went to Toronto uh, for some like music competition or something, and we went out to see Mo Kaufman play at a bar. <clears throat> and I I still have <laughs> the signed ticket. Did he Super do that? Super cool guy. Did he do that thing where he played two saxophones at once and improvise? Like with the it was 30 uh, years ago. I don't remember a darn thing. I, I, I if I didn't have the signed ticket, I wouldn't remember that we actually we actually went to see that. <laughs> Had you known at the time you'd have this connection with him, later on you would have remembered it better, right? Sure. There you go. So sampling. Um, I, I imagine now there's copyright issues that didn't exist when this started. Huh. Um, I mean, there's been a sort of learning curve of how to deal with the intellectual property uh, that the sort of issues that arise with sampling. Uh, but I think uh, probably by now they've got it worked out pretty well. It was kind of in the early 90s when it became like the most uh, the most used method of making hip hop by taking these old old records and taking old sounds and chopping them up. Uh, they, the lawyers went crazy and started to really sort of dictate how that would work. <clears throat> and there was a lot of famous sort of lawsuits at that time uh, of people uh, that, that had before when it was kind of a wild west where you really could just do whatever and there was no repercussions, you just took stuff. Uh, well, that got that got tied down pretty quick. Um, and I've always been I've always kind of avoided that the whole issue just by virtue of the sounds that I sample, which are usually less well known. I mean, the trick with sampling <clears throat> is that it's all fair game if you don't get caught. <laughs> if you and and if you can change a sound enough, mm -hmm. uh, if you can slow it down or chop it into different pieces and flip it upside down, then you're not sampling something that's easily identified, and then you're 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 good to go. And for me, that was always sort of the the trick. That was like the 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 was. I mean, that was the challenge <clears throat> was to was to not just take a catchy, fat, amazing sample and then loop it and then have a song. I mean, what's where's the where's the skill in that? Actually, this guy just passed away a couple of days ago, <clears throat> Matume. Uh, I don't know if you heard about him, uh, but his song "Juicy Fruit" was sampled by the notorious big and by puff daddy and it's one of biggie's biggest most famous songs and it's really just juicy fruit just mm. literally juicy fruit maybe they changed a little bit here and there but it's they took that whole song they thought wow that's awesome rap on that uh and that was never really my that wasn't what was fun for me what i wanted to do was take things that didn't sound super cool <laughs> right off the bat and see if i could repurpose them chop them up uh chop them up so that they're unrecognizable or also just sampling weird things that nobody would have ever heard uh things and often things even just before copyright things from the 1920s and things from the yeah. whatever yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you got into yiddish because of sampling i understand In a <clears throat> yeah i'm in a roundabout way <clears throat> that's kind of a nice way of putting it is that I got into making hip hop and sampling and collecting old records and looking for, uh, like I was saying, looking for sounds that were a little bit off the beaten track uh, and also for sounds that represented my history and where I came from a little bit. Um, I felt weird sampling black music and and taking from African American culture. I was going to participate in hip hop, which is already african-american and black culture uh so to find a voice within that and to find sort of something that felt real for me uh meant looking for sounds that reflected my identity uh and i don't know if it was i, I don't know if i started off quite that like didactically like i've got to do this like i think that's sort of just started coming to me in during the process of becoming a hip hop producer and also just looking at hip hop, which is about representing where you're from mm -hmm. and who you are and being real. 
you got to keep it real and you talk about your crew, you talk about where you're from, you talk about your little corner of the city. And so who am I, this white Jewish kid in Canada? Uh, I, I mean, I love funk. And in fact, funk is what got me to hip hop. Um, so I already loved the source of hip hop. And then, but it just felt weird for me to sample James Brown and the meters and Sly and the Family Stone. Uh, and to do this sort of other layer of cultural colonialism that I, 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 it was the nineties. I didn't even know about that idea of cultural colonialism or, or of cultural appropriation, really. It was sort of before all that mm -hmm. discourse started, um, but it, maybe it was starting then and I didn't want to be a part of that. So I started to look for sounds that could be my story that could tell my story in this new style of music and so that's when i started to really fall upon jewish music and the jewish music this was because i moved to montreal i started to find that kind of music in the salvation armies there mm -hmm. uh, people that were getting rid of their record collections and so i started to find jewish music and I, I keep doing this for Jewish music because it's kind of a, an absurd idea, Jewish music. What is Jewish music? Is it a Jewish composer? Anything they write is Jewish music? Maybe not. Is it something in a certain language? Is it a style? Well, it's complicated. Jews lived all over the world. They were influenced by the music of wherever they were. They influenced the music of wherever they were. Uh, they spoke in many different languages. Jews are, of course, many different races. They 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 were in North Africa. They were there's there's Arab Jews and and there's Jews that speak Spanish and Portuguese and Chinese Jews, uh, whatever. So what is Jewish music? Uh, well, yeah, and so that sort of be, be, began an exploration for me. My roots are Eastern European Jewish, so that's Romania, Ukraine, Russia. Um, and so I started to get interested in that <clears throat> and, and in the language of Yiddish. And I started to find Yiddish theater records. I started to find mm -hmm. instrumental Jewish dance music, uh, which we all know now as klezmer. Uh, I started to find cantorial music, music from the synagogue. Um, and I started to find Hasidic music, the music of the, of the religious 19th century Jews. <clears throat> and their whole tradition of nigunim, which are these wordless mel melodies that are incredible. So I started to find those and started to find on those records stuff that I could sample uh, without uh, like all that identity politics, like aside, these records were full of catchy, funky, like loopable, cool sounds that also as a bonus, were a little bit off the beaten track and like not something I was going to get sued for, and and an, and and a new a new sound that reflected who I was, uh, that still could fit in this new hip hop paradigm. Mm -hmm. So in two thousand five, you produced I think in your own apartment in Montreal mm. and sold through mail order. Your uh, <laughs> album what was it called uh, so called Seder? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that was the beginning of a world where you could do things like that. Like, I, I, I was sort of blessed and cursed to have started in this music business at the time, at, like, where there, I mean, it was, there was a golden age of CDs, of selling CDs. CDs cost nothing to make. It's like it costs a penny. It's a piece of plastic. But you could sell them for $25 each. So the music industry made a killing. Records cost a bit more physically to produce them. So, so this was just like unbelievable. And it was before the internet. It was before mm -hmm. everything was just free and floating through the air. So there was just this golden window of, of people selling music like mad. Um, and so I saw a bit of that. And I sort of started working as a professional musician in that sort of environment where it was like oh you could make a record and then you could sell it and then you could make back the money that it costs to make the record <laughs> and then you could make a living as a musician wow what a concept yeah uh, and so i was i was part of that and like i got 
a record deal and like it was touring and it was on the radio and stuff like that. And then I saw the end of that. I saw the beginning of the internet. Um, but what comes with that sort of dark side of the story is also this incredible like potential that came with these new technologies of someone like me in my basement, able to make a record, um, which just hadn't really existed before. Like if you had a four track, you could make something, but you'd sort of need to go to a studio and fix it up. And then, and then to reproduce it, you'd have to, you know, get a record deal or do, or do something. But for a guy like me to just be all by myself, make a sound, create a thing, and then make a package for it, da 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 da, and then physically produce it myself. Like that was kind of a brave new world. Um, and and that then led to me getting you know proper record contracts and making real records in studios and stuff. But that first that first record, uh, yeah, was a it was an adventure. So here we are talking in in January two thousand. 22 and in 2021 you produce so-called instrumentals right yes so it's sort of like full circle to me like you're on your uh, own <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's trippy i mean the that one that record is kind of a compilation of things that i've done mm -hmm. but you're right i did in the past couple years in this pandemic make i was forced again to make things here um and i don't like it I, <laughs> I, I miss the studio and i miss collaboration and i miss I, yeah i miss the i miss the layers of production that uh, i'd sort of uh built like the way that you make a song okay you get an arrangement from from somebody maybe we'll write an arrangement okay then you go and record drums over here and then maybe you fly to la and get a singer to record on it and then you mm -hmm. like there's just so many fun and then you work with an amazing mixing engineer and then you work with with uh, with an orchestra and then you work like there was just so many fun connections mm -hmm. that now are all just happening over zoom calls and 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 it's 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 yeah it's a, it's it's a strange time to say the least. But Ooh. before this latest Omicron thing, which will be history soon, I got to hear you live. Amen in your to show. that. Yeah, in Die Frosch, your wonderful Yiddish songs show at, here cool. at the National Arts Center, and boy, are you amazing live! I mean, I love <laughs> your recordings, but you're such a great performer. Well, cool. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. And in, a, in fact, that project is a full circle coming mm -hmm. um, because it's me just singing mm -hmm. uh, with a string quartet. And I never was a singer. Like uh, when I started off in the music thing, like I played piano and sure, I was in some musicals a bit in Ottawa growing up as a teenager. And I, I mean, I could, I guess I have a good ear and I can, I don't know how I learned to sing, but, but I just, when I started to hear those old records of Yiddish songs, for some reason, that's what made me want to sing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to sing those songs. Uh, and at first I was sampling these old records, using it to make hip hop and make new funky, crazy Jewish music. Okay. That's cool. But then now here I am just singing songs with a string quartet. So I never saw that one coming. And that's like, that's, that's just a testament to the sort of the, that's just, that's so amazing about life sometimes is that you don't really know why or what you're doing, or you sort of think you're on a track for some reason, but then you start to things dribble into the track and then they sort of take you on another track. And then well, that can become like your most favorite project. Yeah. And I, you're obviously a person who just says yes all the time to all kinds of opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a bit. I also say no to some, yeah, to some you things. You have to, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and you just have to do things you, that you can't explain. Like it just feels good or you just, mm -hmm. they just touch you magically. For instance, Kurt Vile. Yeah. I found, I found a Kurt Vile record when I was 20 digging for records. I found this record of Teresa Stratus singing Kurt Vile. I never heard of Teresa Stratus. I never heard of Kurt Vile. Um, 
maybe I'd heard of the Three Penny Opera, but just random. I mean, that digging through records was such an incredible education in music. Uh, and, and especially then when people were really throwing out their record collections, you, you, when you had to buy a CD for $25, you maybe didn't buy every CD in the store, right? But if a record is 25 cents, you can buy a hundred records and, and, and just check it out. So this Kurt Vile thing 20 years ago, or maybe more now, uh, like I just heard this one song of Kurt Vile, actually it's called Nana's Lead. Maybe you want to, you can like put it in the episode mm -hmm. or something. You can pop it in there. Um, and it just, just blew my mind. I never thought in a million years I'd be able to sing that or play it on the piano or something. It was just this incredible composition. Um, but now I'm totally obsessed with Kurt Vile. And I've been, I've spent the last 20 years <laughs> learning Kurt Vile repertoire. Um, yeah, so that's just another like that's just a weird interest that has become become an obsession. <laughs> yeah, I I have to say by the way about um, the Die Frosch, the Frog uh, show, your mm -hmm. string quartet arrangements were beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, you know, I'm a cool. violinist, and just really your string writing was so nice. Cool. Did you... I didn't I didn't do them all I, okay. by any means. I yeah. I did a I did a bunch of them, but uh, but I got some friends to do it particularly this this guy uh, Michael Winograd who's an amazing clarinetist but just a huge musical brain um, this friend of mine Michael Dubay who's an awesome musician from the Hylotrons from Ottawa who's got his own amazing uh, recording studio lately um, and and yes and I took old arrangements like uh, piano let me see do I have something around here no I was just gonna look Oh yeah, maybe I do. There you go. So I found like uh, either, whoops, can you see that? No. Yeah. Like either piano charts. Here's one from 1921. Uh, either piano charts, these awesome sheet music from like the twenties and, and teens um, or, or choral arrangements. These are some like, like uh, four part harmony. Mm -hmm. But for Yiddish songs, uh, this is from the 60s, actually. And so I just uh, in, in, in archives, uh, there's something called the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Mass. There's the YIVO in New York City. They have and, and just there's tons of music that is just sitting there. Nobody looks at this stuff like sure, there's some nerds uh, and there's some choir directors and there's like maybe the odd person who's interested in Yiddish song goes to these places but mostly not most of the people are lazy if they want anything they go on the internet and download a lead sheet or a, a sheet of lyrics but there's all this incredible repertoire and and at first i was into singing in harmony mm -hmm. but then i found it was hard to get a choir together it's hard to get four voices to learn the parts and stuff uh, and i thought what if i just write this stuff out for string quartet mm -hmm. so that whenever i want <laughs> people can play it It'll be in tune and we'll just hear it. Like it'll be a way to hear this stuff. Um, so, so I would take these four part, these like either piano parts or the arrangements and then like just rearrange them for four voices. Mm -hmm. So the Yiddish Book Center, have they um, digitized their music collection <clears throat> along with a lot of their Yiddish books? Uh, I'm, that's a very good question. I'm not sure they, to be honest, their music collection is mostly these these like piano charts, mm -hmm. um, which are interesting, and which are actually they're just beautiful objects. I, I just yeah. love them physically. From 1927, I mean, it's in it's in perfect shape. This thing is 90 years old, um, uh, but they got a lot of their collection of sheet music from like from out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, sheet okay. music companies. So a lot of what they have is stuff that didn't sell. <laughs> so, uh, so their, their collection is, has huge holes in it because it's basically just overstock. So it's like basically a lot of copies of weird songs that nobody wanted to hear. Um, so, so I'm not so sure it's that useful. I mean, it's, it's useful because even that is a vast collection of mm -hmm. stuff that you can explore but they have all of that and more at other archives. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I actually started studying Yiddish because I read Aronlansky's book about the, ah, um, the cool. man who's, what was it called? The Man Who Saved a Million so, Books. That's it. Yeah. Cool. And I mean, I heard Yiddish as a kid. Uh, my okay. parents spoke it to oh, really? typical, like, so we wouldn't understand. But right. they would speak with the older relatives. But I just always kind of resented it because I didn't understand it. But <laughs> yeah. when I when I read that story, it just blew me away. So huh. I, yeah, I've been dabbling in Yiddish for like three years now, which is why cool. I heard about you. Okay. Someone said, well, if you're studying Yiddish, there's this guy and he does like <laughs> <laughs> so. Where are you from? Ottawa, actually. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we didn't have so much Yiddish to, to experience in Ottawa, did we? Growing up here. Yeah, it was like with, uh, my parents grew up in Montreal. My mom even went to Parrot Shula and like knew how to okay. read and write. And, but I mean, I'm older than you and it was like that generation of um, right. the immigrants still being around. That's it. Um, so yeah, like uh, when you're transcribing, like do you, you must read Yiddish now. Yeah. People may not <laughs> realize that it's written with Hebrew script um, because it's often written with right. English, but it's not the original. Yeah. <laughs> I have that too. Yeah. <laughs> keep keep it around. Yeah. Um, and so yes, I, I, like you said, I mean, this is a long story. We could get into it. Just the sort of idea of Yiddish in secular, uh, like, uh, yeah, in secular Canadian culture. These 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 people that have what's the word? I, I have. I'm I'm losing my word for uh, assimilated. Yeah. For for <laughs> assimilated Jews stopped speaking Yiddish basically I mean it's a very long story um but when I grew up in Ottawa well in Chelsea Quebec which is just north of Ottawa we'd go into Temple Israel in on the Ottawa side and we'd go to Hebrew school that's and right I, okay there you go <laughs> see nice so great so so I learned how to read and read Hebrew but not understand it because I just had to to do my bar mitzvah okay great yeah. so so you you get this this text and you can enunciate it say it out loud and you do the bar mitzvah thing that's cool but i never was into religion i just always was fighting against it um and then when i found yiddish and it, i found this whole situation that is written in the the letters that i knew already so it was kind of an amazing revelation to be able to now read all this material that actually can sort of make a little bit of sense. I mean, when you're reading Hebrew, it's this ancient weird language, but Yiddish is, as we know, a mixture of old German with all the romance languages and this and that. So if, when you're reading something in Yiddish, like legislature, le legislature, okay. <laughs> That's the legislator. <laughs> I'm just yeah. reading in the dictionary. Yeah. So, so it's it's an amazing access to like a whole a whole thing. So, so I've learned in the singing of the songs, uh, I'm learning the language. I've never really sat down and tried to really learn the language. I have some misgivings about that. I just feel weird to learn a language that I'll never really talk with anybody except for other nerds that have learned the language. I want to sing the songs. I want to know what I'm singing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, I've been doing it for 20 years. So, so I've certainly got a, a vocabulary. I can certainly understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but, I, but I, 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 I don't like to say that I really speak and write and read Yiddish. I can read it. I can, mm -hmm. I can write it. I don't know. I, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I'm still, yeah. Yeah. So for a lot of people listening won't know, and I think it might be interesting to them, that the Hasidim are not allowed to access all the secular material in Yiddish. And they, you know, religious Jews, I think, also weren't at the beginning of the 20th century going to Yiddish theater or films or reading novels or, you know, all the things that translations of, of um, all kinds of literature into Yiddish. So hmm. all that was like, they're not allowed. I don't know about not allowed. It's just that they're not allowed to engage with secular culture in general. It's right. So, so but, whether or not it's in Yiddish, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters to me because like there's this wealth <laughs> of Yiddish that culture they're not, that they're yeah. not accessing, and it's their first language. So. Yeah, but there's a wealth of Yiddish culture that we're not accessing because a wealth of religious Yiddish culture that we're not accessing. They don't mind. They're making their own culture. They have their own music. They have their own literature. Don't worry about it too much. They're okay. <laughs> 
they're fine. <laughs> You'd mentioned Nigunim before, um, these these wordless songs. Yeah. And I was uh, I heard your talk you did for the Yiddish Book Center last year, and you had mentioned that there was a notated Nigunim um, mm -hmm. in archives, which I found quite interesting that someone bothered to write these down. <laughs> and you also sure. mentioned, mm -hmm, you also mentioned yeah. that klezmer musicians tended not to write down their songs or arrangements because they kind of kept it to themselves and passed it down. Did I mention well, that? Okay. You I have, mean, I just yeah. I think it was just a question of uh economics and stuff like they just did, didn't weren't educated necessarily in that way um i think at a certain point even in in hasidic history uh they started to write down just even what the rabbis had said mm -hmm. uh and that was a big move to do that and i think it's just at a certain point in a culture it's just like okay like we got to get this down somehow <laughs> like before we forget it all um I, i'd be curious to look into when they did start notating all the nigunim. Um, it could, yeah, it could be a fairly modern idea to write them down. And even like, even, even post-war, even just like mm -hmm. when they realized, oh my God, like we've lost so much, like we better write this, this down. Mm -hmm. um, those books are great. You should get those books. They're called the Sefer HaNigunim, the, the Nigunim books. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a two volume set put out by, I think it's Chabad Labavitch. And you can you can find it anywhere. It's but they're awesome. They have and if you if you get better at Yiddish, then you can read all the sort of explanations for each niggin because every niggin has a story. Mm -hmm. Every niggin was composed by some famous rabbi or uh, and yeah. It, also the website um, there's like chabad.org. Uh, do you know that website? Uh, I know about it. Yeah. Okay, because it has. It has every volume of, of there was, they made a series of records of, for Nigunim, for Chabad Nigunim, Lubavitch Nigunim, which is just one, one sort of dynasty of, 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 of Hasidim. Um, but they made these records in like the 50s and 60s of groups of Hasidim singing these Nigunim. And all of those records have been digitized and they're all available at that website it's just very convenient handy handy way to see and it has all the it's basically and it's sort of in affiliation with the book like you can read along with that book mm -hmm. and you can go okay page whatever and then it actually has the story of the niggin it has the melody written out it has the words if there are words because not every niggin is just without words um yeah that's a great resource cool Thank there's you. lots of resources now online yeah. yeah um so tales from odessa mm. was a yiddish musical theater piece that you wrote the words and music for and it was commissioned after somebody saw your incredible puppet <laughs> <laughs> musical the season right something like that yes yeah, so the 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 director at siegel center uh they actually kind of supported this first musical that i wrote mm -hmm. um which is called the season it's got these these fuzzy puppets i think there's there's one over there. Yeah, no, you can't really see them. I'll, I'll go get them later. Mm -hmm. um, so I had all these puppets kicking around. Someone said, we want to do a show with with involving different people in the scene. So like a dancer and this. And I was like, okay, I'm going to write a musical. I'll put the puppets. I made a show. It was cool. We were supposed to just do it one night. We did it one night. But like I had all this music and I'd written a musical. So I went into the studio. I recorded it. It's called The Season. Check it out. And then that led to other things I did. Uh, I've gone on to do season two and season three, and hopefully I'll do season four next year in, or this year in Germany, but I don't believe anything is going to happen this year <laughs> again. So who knows? But yes, so, so the director of the Siegel Center uh, said, hey, would you be interested in writing something for our Yiddish theater, which as you know, is the basically one of the, maybe the, the two operating Yiddish theaters in North America today. Mm -hmm. This used to be, a, you know, there used to be hundreds of Yiddish theaters in, in America and in Canada with plays going on all the time. Like, can you imagine the amazing scene of like Second Avenue with literally dozens of theaters open doing new shows all the time? Like, holy cow, what a, what a amazing thing that we missed. Uh, so, that's sad, but but there are still these uh, these two Yiddish theaters, this Dora Wasserman Yiddish theater. 
So they asked me, what would you do if you were to do a Yiddish theater show? And I thought about it for a while. And then I, I, I mean, I realized I wanted to do something that should be a story that could be in Yiddish. If you're going to go to the trouble of doing a Yiddish theater show, like, why and and basically no one understands yiddish except for older people or hasidim or a couple nerds who are learning yiddish now um like it's going to be in translation so you're going to have people watching the show in a language they don't understand <laughs> so, uh actually this was many layers of translation because so i was like so i was like it's got to be something where the like there's a reason for these people to be living and acting in yiddish so I I'd, I'd sort of been a little bit obsessed with Isaac Babel and uh his Odessa stories. I don't know if you've have you ever read them? I've not. Get on it. It's awesome. Uh these are these gangster stories, Jewish gangsters in Odessa uh at the turn of the last century and this incredible sort of Robin Hood figure of this guy Benya Crick who's the king of the Jewish gangsters. And these like violent, funny, sexual, amazing stories that to me were kind of like Fiddler on the Roof upside down, like, mm -hmm. like Fiddler on the Roof. OK, we get it. We've seen Fiddler on the Roof. OK. And it's and that presents a very kind of idyllic, nostalgic, sentimental view of the shtetl of the old Jewish Eastern European world. I mean, it's based on these amazing old Sholem Aleichem Yidd Yiddish stories, um, but then it was converted for Broadway to become this sort of weird, like simulacra of, of Jewish existence in Eastern Europe. Great. How about some gritty, like swearing, violent prostitutes, like killing, <laughs> like Jewish stories, okay. Uh, well, these Odessa stories are that, and they're, I mean, the the stories themselves are like, they can't be translated onto the stage. They're so, the language of them, I, and I'm not reading them in the original Russian, but Isaac Babel is just this incredibly famous writer in Soviet Russia for his language and for his incredible writing. So, so I, I, so you, you, when you're, when you're translating something or like um, converting something from the page to the stage, mm -hmm. like you kind of gotta, you kind of gotta throw your hands up and not like, it's not the same thing, it's different. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. So I kind of relaxed into that idea and that notion. And I, and I said, let's do, let's do this. They, and they said, cool. Um, and so, yeah, that was an amazing passion project. I got to basically design everything and uh, like i worked with my favorite this uh, this amazing costume designer and we really did like research on like historical uh dress of of odessa and of jews in odessa um and then i put together a band and i wrote music for like a real like a village band that might have been in odessa so i hired in montreal i hired a a Romanian cymbal on player, a, a Bulgarian flute, like nigh player, mm -hmm. uh, a, a Roma, like uh, Moldovan accordionist, because Montreal has these people living there, you know? So I, and I sort of met them in the Jewish music scene, meeting musicians from Eastern Europe. So I got them. I got Michael Winograd, who I spoke about before, mm -hmm. to come up from New York City. He's really one of the great Jewish uh, klezmer clarinetists today. Uh, and then, like, uh, actually, Pemi Paul, who was from the quartet uh, that you saw, he was in there, too. And a bass player, a drummer. Um, and, and it was like a real, like, fake Eastern European band playing new original songs for an old story that was written in Russian that I wrote in English and then was translated into Yiddish. <laughs> and then you read it with subtitles. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but what an opportunity, probably once in a lifetime, I have to say, unless they ask me to do it again, but things have changed there a little bit. And also just it's harder and harder to, I mean, right now, nobody's doing anything. Yeah. Um, but also the Yiddish theater scene, it's not quite as strong as 
believe it or not, as it was 10 years ago, mm -hmm. like at least there was support then. It's sort of, it's harder and harder to get the audience to come out. So for me, it was the once in a lifetime opportunity to work with a company, to work with a real theater company. There was 40 people on stage. Like it was, and, and to get that kind of, of support and that kind of space, even just the space, they own their theater. Mm -hmm. So to rehearse, they have a big fat space to work in. That's rare. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have, and because the cast is mostly volunteers, amateurs, well, to, to get 40 people dedicated to a project, that's impossible in, in theater and in, and in professional worlds. Um, so it was really just, uh, it just mind blowing to see, <laughs> to see my work presented like that. I went every single night that it was on. It was on for about three weeks and I went, mm -hmm. Maybe I missed a couple, but but I would just go and sit in the theater and watch the, the curtains open. And there's Odessa with this band playing these songs out of control. And I got to work with Miriam Hoffman, who is a an amazing translator um, and thinker. She's actually her book is incredible. So she translated with the help of the Dora Wasserman Yiddish Theater. Mm. Um, they translated because I wrote the lyrics and the text of the of the play actually i know i worked with a playwright now that i think about it this guy derek goldman he wrote the the script mm -hmm. uh, but i wrote all the songs in english and he wrote the script in english based on these russian stories that were mm -hmm. translated uh and then she translated it into yiddish there's short clips on youtube uh, that look great but is there like a full length thing that like you have access to or people can buy uh, <laughs> I have a, a videotape of, of uh, not a tape. I mean, I have it on my computer, but I mm -hmm. do have like a, the camera on a tripod showing yeah. the, the show. Um, and actually I have another, a couple other angles. It's, it's a little clunky to watch it like that. It's, I, I, I hate watching my theater shows like that are just filmed. Like they just, uh, it doesn't read. It's like, it's, it's painful to watch. But it's a way to see it for sure. But if you want to hear it, it's out as a record. For yeah, sure. no, I, I know that. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, it, because you're saying so much work and this is- Right, right, right. It would be a shame if it was lost to history. Puppets, puppets too. There was this amazing, uh, Clea Miniker is this amazing puppeteer who is a master of shadow puppets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I got her to, to do, there was a whole layer of like shadow puppetry mm -hmm. going on um, in the background, like, well, like all the windows had screens and stuff. So like mm -hmm. different stuff would be happening in the screens. Wow. That's great. It should happen again. I mean, it should, I would love to see it happen somewhere. I'd really love to see it in Odessa. And what I'd love to see too, is like a filmed version of it. Like mm -hmm. not, uh, not a filmed stage version of it, but like a filmed version of it. Like they do with cats, but maybe not yeah. as not, not like what they did with cats. Cause that was not a success did you see it no but i was just <laughs> you know puppets reminding me actually i last night i watched your entire uh third season the puppet music okay because it's it's I'll, I'll link it it's accessible and boy right it was just so charming and beautiful <laughs> the, and the third one yeah okay cool it's okay. on that yeah, the web the youtube of the the festival in hamburg did you see the second one i only saw parts of it but the, okay. the third one i just sat and watched the whole thing through cool 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 See again for me. Oh, it's hard to watch. Also, that was like maybe the second run. Like we mm -hmm. we were just getting our feet, and like that show really started coming together. So to mm -hmm. to watch it and like see every mistake and every sort of slow entrance and eh, it's painful. But but yeah, I'm glad I'm glad that we filmed it. Kieran Alualia, she's pretty cool, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. The, and the whole thing. Like I um. My kids are growing up now, but we used to love going to children's theater. It's such a, a specialized genre. And I remember talking <laughs> to one of the actors and they said, my whole career has been doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's what amazes me about you. Cause you know, you're this hip hop guy, you do all this stuff. And then what this amazing musical theater for kids and it works on all the levels for all the mm -hmm. adults. <laughs> well, I mean, it's weird. Cause I don't really think about doing it for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, but then surprise, surprise, funny, fuzzy creatures like singing songs like kids love it. So so that's awesome. But I think that is a trick for people that create for kids that they don't necessarily think down. 
or like or like like i don't when i was writing it i wasn't thinking no oh, this song is okay but if i could make it easier to understand or something no like you just try to write good songs you try to write mm-hmm. catchy melodies and you try to write a story that is clear um i mean obviously not every clear story is going to be appropriate for kids uh and like i'm i'm sitting right now in my childhood bedroom and i'm surrounded by childhood stuff and i think i had a pretty good childhood uh where and like the things that i loved as a child like i just i i still love them like i i i <laughs> i can sort of in a weird way remember the vibe of of being a kid mm-hmm. um and that probably comes out in the sort of playfulness of of the of the shows that i do so you had one grandfather who was a magician who um and well did I mean, some he, magic yeah 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 yeah. okay yeah. and and you do magic too uh-huh i mean yeah it's one of my hobbies uh like when when you see people that it's their whole lives then i'm i i think i'm not really a magician but but it's a hobby and an interest i mean i was practicing yesterday mm-hmm. i have my my set right over there i'm, I'm i was practicing mm-hmm. the cups and balls here look i could show you an incredible trick with this watch <laughs> you're really good okay some people are listening to the podcast and they're like what did he just do <laughs> he made a yellow thing to disappear yeah um but so yeah magic these are all hobbies and 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 things I started as a kid and I just kept hacking away at and maybe got better at for sure at a certain point I hope I like to think how about um your musical education like you Not took piano much. lessons I took piano lessons that was it uh I took piano lessons in Ottawa from a piano teacher named Gabor Finta you ever hear, hear of him yeah okay so Gabor Finta taught like uh what was that method of uh like where kids listen and 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 like they don't learn the no- names of the notes and they just learn to sing things and stuff you mean uh Mark? kodai oh, kodai kodai so he was from the kodai school i don't really know what of the method that i learned was very kodai-ish uh i always had a really good ear so i was a terrible reader i just never learned how to read because i could just pick it up by ear mm-hmm. uh and so to this day, I'm a terrible reader. I've gotten way better, but but uh, but it's a, a, a struggle. I feel almost dyslexic when it comes to music reading. Like, it's just like, I just can't, it just like takes forever to get through a bar. Um, so that was, I mean, as a kid taking piano lessons, forced, bribed to take it, but I had a good ear and I was, I was musical. So I would enter competitions. I would win Kiwanis things here and there. And, uh, and eventually I got to take like jazz piano lessons. Um, and I studied with this guy, Peter Brown in, in town, who's, who's still actively playing around town. Uh, and that was for me cooler because I could improvise and it was sort of just, it wasn't just always classical music, which I d- didn't really speak to me necessarily. Um, and that was it for musical education. I went to McGill to study like literature and philosophy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm glad I did at the time. I didn't want to study something that I loved and just did for fun. I never thought I was going to be a musician. I was making beats at the time. And so like, that's what I would do for fun. I would get home from school and I would make beats. (laughs) Uh, And then, so, so, so education wise now, I wish I had studied composition and harmony. Um, and so like, here I am looking at, uh, like this, this, uh, Barry Harris, Mm -hmm. who just passed away a couple months ago, this 91 year old, um, jazz educator. And he's sort of talking about harmony and stuff. And I'm trying to understand that. And like, I guess I just teach myself. Uh, that's how I learned how to arrange. I just sort of started doing it and popping notes into Sib- Sibelius and then <laughs> and, and seeing how things move around. Um, but now I do wish that I had studied. St- I wish it was just deeply ingrained in me so that I could just sort of spew it out. Um, but yeah. 
<laughs> if you'd spent the time back then doing that, you wouldn't have had time for all this other stuff. That's the time, <laughs> right? That's only. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And you never know what you're going to get. Like, you don't know why you're on a path or why you're not on another path. And like studying literature and philosophy is uh, like, I don't regret that. that. That's, that just is good for a brain to do. <laughs> and it does. And it helps if you just study music, you can become sort of stuck in the technical, like endless war that it is to, to master an instrument or to master the, the theory of it, which is endless and, and it's going to drive you crazy. Um, and then you sort of forget that there's a world that you should be trying to sort of engage the music with maybe mm -hmm. or something, or there's stories to tell uh, that are, that you can use music, but so it's good to open your mind and study just how to think. Yeah. Yeah. I used to think, um, you know, when I got, my career established as a violinist, I would magically have all this time to learn other instruments. This was my fantasy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so not true, right? Just right. still learning to play the violin every day. It's just oh, what yeah. I have to do, you know? Right, right, right. So let's talk about <laughs> a lot of um, really legendary uh, people you've worked with, like um, Fred, is Fred Wesley, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, Fred Wesley. He is, I mean, that's a good one to start with because he is really my hero. Uh, and he is, I mean, he created my favorite music of all time, which is the funk of James Brown in the 1970s. He was the guy writing the horn lines mm -hmm. and, and being the band leader uh, for those sessions of the JBs, the James Brown band uh, in the 1970s, the early 70s. So literally my favorite music. I mean, you can put on P Pass the Peas by James Brown and it's like, there's it nothing better. Like it's just, it never got better. Sure. I love Brahms. I love, uh, I love Kurt Weill. I love Charlie Parker. I love Brazilian music. I love, you know, everything. But for some reason, and maybe it's just because it was what I loved when I was 15 which winds up being the music that you sort of think is the most important and it kind of gets ingrained in your DNA. So, so Fred Wesley uh, is a trombone player and he, I mean, it's a long story, but basically I found out he was being active and still on tour. Um, basically the drummer in this band, I was, I was playing with David Krakauer, who is this, this virtuoso uh, clarinetist who has a classical career but is like well known for his klezmer his cl clarinet klezmer he's also a teacher he teaches at basically every famous music school in new york city he's got a position at whatever you name it he's he's teaching um an incredible player like he really is just an amazing player so already that's cool to be working with him and i was in his band and helping him sort of produce his records and make his sort of brand of funky modern klezmer music. Um, and then we were, we were hanging out one night and, and the drummer in the band said, yeah, my friend plays with Fred Wesley. He's in Fred Wesley's band. I was like, Fred Wesley is still on tour. Oh my God. Uh, like that's incredible. And it just sort of got me thinking like, what if we got Fred Wesley to deal with klezmer <laughs> and Jewish music and, and particularly this project with David Krakauer, what if we got him together? So I suggested it and, and like Krakauer like was all over it. And he was like, oh my God, this would be amazing. And through this drummer guy and the friend and then the manager and the this and that, and we had the same publisher in Europe, um, we got in touch with Fred Wesley and, and basically cold called him, hey, would you be interested in a project looking at this Eastern European Jewish dance music <laughs> from, from the 19th century? Like... Like, how insane is that? Uh, like, I bet 99% of professional legendary musicians would not open that email, would not answer, certainly, but just they wouldn't cry. Like, why would they? Fred Wesley is happily on tour. He's a world famous legend of his style. He does not need to be doing weird things. But Fred Wesley is such a cool guy 
And he's so into music and into collaboration that he wrote back and said, huh, that sounds kind of interesting. Send me something to listen to. So we sent him like recordings from the 1920s of these bands, which actually do have a lot of brass and are mm-hmm. and are danceable and catchy and funky and in virtuoso playing and beautiful melodies. And as a great musician who has his ears open and and just is is like looking for opportunities to explore, which is so rare. Um, and he's also just the the quintessential collaborator. Like he's collaborated with just, I mean, he played with Ray Charles and Count Basie and Ike and Tina Turner and Michael Jackson and and like uh, whatever. I mean, he's uh, he's like, he's played with great people. And as a collaborator, like he brings himself and his voice to these projects, but he's able to help those projects get be better like without and and without being like like coming and just being the star you know like Mm -hmm. he's just got this humble collaboration vibe and so uh he said wow these are beautiful songs this is cool let's meet and so we met and we jammed we jammed like i had my machine he's also i mean as the guy who invented funk which then became disco which then became hip hop, basically. I mean, he's basically the godfather of hip hop. Uh, he's been sampled to death. All that James Brown music has been sampled all over the place. Uh, he even rapped, I mean, on, on this record from 1972, um, there's a song called Brother Got the Rap or something. And James Brown says, uh, he says, Fred, like rap. He says rap. And it's 1972. Mm -hmm. And Fred Wesley says, I don't want nobody telling me what to do. And he talks Mm -hmm. in rhyme over top of a beat. Well, I mean, (laughs) that's rap, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So so in a way, he was the inventor of this whole genre that has gone on to become a worldwide, total global phenomenon of every culture of art, Mm -hmm. music, dance. Um, and like music and song and poetry. So Fred Wesley, he's the godfather. And when we met, he was like, I don't really like rap. I don't, I don't like hip hop. Like, I don't, I don't get it. Um, and I had my machine with me, which is a, this like, which samples and you make loops and you make beats. And by the end of our, like the jam, he was like, that's pretty cool. Actually, he, he was seeing the potential for the machine in music that it didn't it didn't necessarily take his job away, which I think which I think a lot of real musicians were afraid that hip hop would do. And it did for sure. Um, But it was pretty cool for me to sort of bring Fred Wesley back to hip hop or like to show him that there was like the viability of this music that Mm -hmm. actually he was sort of the inventor of. (laughs) So Fred Wesley, what an honor to work with him. And then from then we, we created that band called Abraham Incorporated which has a full brass section and Fred Wesley and David Krakauer. And that is awesome. Um, We've had, of course, three tours now canceled since the beginning of this pandemic, trying to, uh, because we actually made a new record two years ago or three, I guess now it's five years ago because it was two years before (laughs) the end of the world. Uh, And then like, like I just work with him now, like we're friends. I, 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 I text him and he says, what's up. And for my musicals, I get him to write the overtures. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to mention that. I find that- <laughs> Which is insane to get the guy who wrote for Parliament Funkadelic. I send him the melodies for like the themes and then he like writes an overture and he even did it for the Odessa Stories musical. He wrote the overture. So Fred Wesley wrote for Cymbalom and Accordion and Clarinet. Uh, and it's those kind of connections and weird meetings that like absolutely blow my mind and make life worth living. <laughs> yeah, that, that thing about the cold call. So you, I bet you've done a few more of those in your career. Yeah, I mean, often cold calls don't really get you anywhere, to be mm-hmm. honest. Uh, it usually helps to have some sort of in. I mean, the Fred Wesley call was cold, but it was also through... Yeah the connection of the drummer and the publisher. Mm -hmm. And so like someone gave him the phone. 
if I were to call Tom Waits and say, hey, Tom, do you want to do a song with me? I'm not getting through. Like, uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> also, it might have been a different time a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, now, with the interconnection and the internet where everybody's on everybody's ass all the time, it's harder to make a connection that cuts through to somebody. Yeah. If you're on Twitter and you're famous, well, you're getting a thousand emails a day from from different people who want to do something. So, so this was kind of more a more a pre digital meeting of just like it was probably through a letter in the mail or something. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so things had to have a way of connecting better like that. Um, yeah, and I. I can't think of other people. I guess Kiran Alawalia, she's not, I mean, no offense to Kiran Alawalia, she's not quite on the same level as Fred Wesley. But to me, she was a cool, genius musician, artist mm -hmm. that I thought, wouldn't that be interesting to get her? She sings, as you know from last night, she's like mm -hmm. this Indian classical um, singer from Canada, but she lives in New York City. And that was kind of a cold call, like just... I mean, she's Canadian, so there was a bit of a connection there. And actually, I know her accordionist, so there was a bit of a connection mm -hmm. there. But it was basically, I went to her concert in Montreal, and I said, and after the concert, I approached her and said, hey, Kieran, I'm, I'm thinking of this musical, and I think you'd be cool. I'm having a human. Every, every season has a human in it. It's a bunch of puppets with one human. And Fred Wesley was in one, by, by the way. Um, you should watch it, too. I think it's also online. Fred Wesley with the puppets, again, what an incredible testament to his openness and bravery uh, for him to say, okay, I mean, he's 77 years old. Like, do you want to be in a musical with puppets where you're on stage acting and singing with pup like, no, like I don't, but, <laughs> but for some reason he said, yeah, man, that sounds cool. I'll do it. So that was amazing. So Kieran Alawalia, I just said, Hey, would you, would you do that? I guess it's easier when you have a track record, uh, and now I have a bit of a track record and, and I have people that I've worked with so I can send people. So can, is there something I can hear? Okay, there is. Um, so that helps, but I still feel like a novice and like a, like a, like, I mean, it's imposter syndrome, right? Like that is real. <laughs> like, like I sit here every day feeling like an imposter, like a hundred percent. Sure. I get better at things. I know I'm good at stuff, but uh, I'll guess I'll never be good enough for myself to be. I mean, I'm good at stuff, but I'm not, I'll never be Charlie Parker. I'll never be Kurt Vile. I'll be me and I'll try to be the best me that can be. <laughs> and part of feeling that imposter syndrome, I think, is motivating to keep working and to keep trying to get better so that maybe one day you won't feel like an imposter. <laughs> I, I was just thinking, so that uh, the um, NFB movie about you, the so-called movie, I think it's been about 14 years now. Wow. You said almost exactly what you just said now. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to ask you about that, but you just went there. Yeah. Um, but, and 14 years later, I swear to God, I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not just saying that to be, to f seem like like i swear to god i sit here frustratedly hacking away feeling like an idiot all day sure i know when i get somewhere and i know when i and and i and i like things that i do and i can listen to things i'm not one of those people that just like can't ever see or hear what they've done again when i make something that i've worked hard at to make good and then it is good <laughs> and i'm i'm happy like there's a song, uh, the song I never got to sing on, I think I might have even done it. No, I didn't do it in Ottawa, but it's from the second musical, the second season, and it's with Fred Wesley. And I think it's my best song. Like, and, and so to recognize that for myself is good. Like I can, hear, it's called the song, it? I, the song I never got to sing. Oh, that's what it's called. Okay. That's what it's called. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it's just, it brings together all my experience and the lyrics and the melody and it's a bit of the Jewish music and it's working with Fred Wesley and the arrangement and the recording and the, and the story and it's all that. And it's finally got to one, two minutes of something mm -hmm. that I can go, ah, okay, 
if if I die now, at least there's that one song that people can hear that I that I, like I don't cringe when I hear when I hear mm -hmm. it. <laughs> um, your song. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, I can't think of it now. The um, it's that beautiful song about being who you are with kids, and there's like the amazing head dresses, and they're what what's the name of that song? Okay, work with what you got. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> okay. Did you design those um, costumes? No, no, no. Nope, that was folks out in Vancouver of all places. Mm -hmm. um, and a very weird video, but okay, cool. Uh, when I make a video often, I haven't in a long time, unfortunately, like just because the industry has changed. Like I used to be able to make a video. I'd make a record and then the label would be like, okay, and now make a video that doesn't happen anymore. Like uh, I've got to raise all the money myself and I've got to, you got to make the record yourself and pay for all that too. Like, it's just a, so you make crappy videos yourself or uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know anyway. So that, but usually when I was making videos for me, it was fun to work with someone who had ideas mm -hmm. that I could just like, they would be free to do their thing. I'd made the song. Now you be creative. You bring your genius. Um, and so like my most sort of viral famous thing I ever did was the head coming open video. Yeah. And it was sort of an idea that we had together, the director, but mostly it was that amazing genius director that heard the song and was inspired. Go to it. I don't want to, I didn't want to be like, micromanaging every every choice of uh, with that mm -hmm. with those kind of collaborations and that's kind of the same with all my collaborations like i'm a control freak and i like to see things through but but once i've once i'm working with someone who is a genius and like that's why i'm working with them i'm gonna let them be a genius mm -hmm. to enrich everything <laughs> um would you speak a little bit about your yiddish culture cruise that you did many years ago such an Ooh. amazing story. Sure. Um, so basically, how does that one start? I mean, like I, I'd started going to being involved in the Yiddish revival movement. Um, for lack of a better term, that's what it, that's what it is. Like in the late seventies, these hippies started getting into these archives and discovering this culture that had either died out with the Holocaust and been killed off. Um, or had been assimilated in North America, people stopped speaking Yiddish. Okay, people like Henry Sapoznik and Zev Feldman uh, started discovering this old material and talking about it, discovering old musicians even that were still around. Hot tip, Dave Terrace, the greatest klezmer clarinetist of all time. There's an amazing video of him doing a whole concert that was presented in 1979. Um, by these people, they were like, they'd found him, he was still alive, and they put on this concert. You can see it on YouTube. It's awesome. I mean, he's super old, but he still is just mind-blowing. Um, so they started to reissue things, and then they started to have these camps and these, like, retreats for Yiddish culture. And the, the first big one was really Klez Camp in, in New York uh, in the Catskills. Uh, and so they started to invite some of the old masters that were still alive and they started to try to sing the songs again. And then these sort of bands popped up like um, the Klezmorium uh, in California or, or uh, Capella in, in New York. Uh, and they started to play the songs again. They started to learn the style or try to sing the Yiddish songs. Of course, there, there were still people that knew this stuff, it, like your parents and like the people in the Montreal Yiddish theater, like there was still people that spoke Yiddish and sang Yiddish songs. So the, the idea of revival is problematic because sorry, it wasn't dead. Um, and also, I mean, like you were saying, the Hasidim speak Yiddish. So like the language itself is spoken by millions of people. So anyway, but in the mainstream Jewish culture, Yiddish was not present. So they started to have these festivals. And then it became sort of an international movement. And then there was uh, m new bands that were taking the music even further, the klezmatics. They were adding rock and roll and jazz to the mix. And they were, you know, and then I came around in the 20, whatever, the 2000s, and I was adding hip hop. And, I, and so the music was 
evolving and 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 changing with the times and these festivals were sort of at the heart of that movement uh and out of those festivals came all these bands and all these all this activity and records were being made and there was sort of a golden age in the late 90s of the revival <laughs> with people like the klezmatics and then they like met with uh what's his name um it's like perlman. perlman who i also played with and I, we could talk about that too if you mm -hmm. want um and so they had a like kind of a real moment there where they were doing huge concerts with it's like perlman and doing klezmer and that's great well, meanwhile, I was starting to be invited to these festivals because I was doing something kind of new with this mix of hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, so I was invited to London Klezfest and I was invited to Paris Klezfest and I was invited to Los Angeles Klezfest. And, and then I was invited to um, St. Petersburg Klezfest, which was particularly interesting because it was, to me anyway, it was interesting because it was there. It was where the culture came from <clears throat> sort of i mean that was part of the story uh and 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 at that festival were a lot of people from eastern europe so people from former soviet places people from moldova and romania which is where my people were from that were still there they were still living there and still singing you their songs and so i started to meet people there and i thought wouldn't it be awesome to have a festival back in the source so St. Petersburg isn't exactly the source. It's, it's, I mean, sure, it's nearby, but like it, it's not, I was thinking more like Romania, Ukraine, and at least like actually somewhere where my grandfather was from, which was near Odessa in the Ukraine. So just on a whim, I started talking to people. I was like, wouldn't it be awesome to have a, like a festival in Odessa or a festival in Kishinev in Moldova or something? People were like, yeah, that'd be cool. And then I don't know why, I guess we were on a boat. <laughs> At some point I went back to Odessa with my parents. Um, I don't know how that started, but just we thought it would be cool to visit where, you know, the grandparents were from. And so I, I was on tour and I said, okay, after my tour, I'll meet you in Odessa. And so we did that. And maybe then we were on a boat and I thought, imagine like a cruise like a klezmer yiddish festival on a boat <laughs> in back in the source so it was just a stupid idea i told my parents and for some reason like now thinking back i don't know how on earth this actually happened but but my parents got interested and 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 they got involved in and they said this is a cool idea why don't let's do it like we'll organize it like thinking back I, it blows my mind so so they started, we started to really put a plan together and hire a boat. My parents are both from Winnipeg, which is where the people that didn't go to Montreal went uh, when they came to Canada uh, from Eastern Europe. So my parents are both from Winnipeg, where there's a big um, population of, of what are they, uh, this religion of kind of Christians. Uh, the Mennonites? The Mennonites. There's a huge Mennonite community also from Ukraine. <clears throat> and so we started looking into it and we found that, th that they had Mennonite culture cruises where people would go back to the Ukraine mm -hmm. and visit their roots. Well, we got in touch with them and we sort of coordinated with them. And actually my parents went on a Mennonite cruise to get, to get the vibe. Uh, and it was a boat that went along the Dnieper River from Ki Kiev to Odessa. And uh, we thought, okay, cool, like, perfect. We'll sort of like, we'll like, we'll, 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 we'll plop our Klezmer crews onto the shape that they've already created. And so I hired like all the best Klezmer people uh, that I knew <clears throat> from the scene, David Krakauer and Michael Alpert, this amazing trumpet player from Philly, Susan Hoffman Watts, and her mother, Elaine Hoffman Watts. Unfortunately, in the end, they couldn't come. <clears throat> but uh, Elena, Elena Kravitz from London plays violin. And uh, who else? Vanya Zhuk, for this amazing guitarist from Russia. Uh, someone from Paris, someone from London, someone from here and there. Um, sort of an international crew crew i hired this 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 older french lady who's an expert in jewish dance uh i hired uh, the 
the or actually not, not even hired i just kind of invited and and they could come for free um eugene orenstein from montreal who's like this amazing the head of the jewish studies department at mcgill um a yiddish language professor uh this guy david katz came who is like a super famous yiddishist who's based in lithuania um and so all those people were like the like the the staff but then 200 people signed up to come. Um, so we have this boat, this, <laughs> this cruise ship, leaving from Kiev and going down the Dnieper River um, with concerts every night. Uh, th this, this guy got on the boat halfway through uh, who lived in Dnieper Petrovsk in Zaporozhye. Uh, and his name was Arkady Gendler. And he was actually a guy I'd met at St. in St. Petersburg. And maybe he was one of the reasons I'd thought of the whole idea. Uh, but he was still based in this town where my grandfather was from. And he sort of became the, the heart and soul and spirit of the cruise. And we would do concerts. We'd stay up every night in the bar, drinking vodka and playing music and singing Yiddish songs. And then we'd get to a town and we'd do a concert in the town. We'd go to these little towns or even big towns, Kiev and Odessa, and we'd like put on a concert for the public with local musicians. Um, and, and yeah, that was sort of how the whole so-called movie started because I pitched this idea to my old professor, Gary Bytel. He was my professor at McGill. I said, you should come and make a movie about this boat cruise. And he did. But then that became a movie more about me, which is too bad because he's got tons of footage of just the boat cruise. And that was sort of what I thought the movie was about. And then it turned out to be a movie about me, which is cool, but also a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> uh, and also we didn't get to see enough of about the cruise. Mm -hmm. I'd love to revisit that footage one day and maybe like that could be expanded into a whole situation. Um, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> okay, I'll get, I'll call Gary later. And actually, yeah, I was wondering if you're still friends with him after all that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. In, in the movie, which is is great, um, you you got a chance to do some of your filmmaking. There's like these little episodes uh, that are mm -hmm. really cool. I I'd love to. Yeah, that was fuck. That was super fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think in your interview with um, your friend Daniel Mate recently, like online too, you had talked. Oh, wow. About, you really like, digging deep. Here. Oh, I I do research. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you'd mentioned um, during the pandemic that you were like doing just portraits of friends was one of your ways of coping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that came out of nowhere. I mean, whew. <laughs> like I never drew before. I mean, I drew cartoons mm -hmm. as a kid. Uh, never really seriously. I mean, I never had time to do things. Mm -hmm. So since I've been sitting here, <laughs> I've started drawing let me see if i have some kicking around here yeah just a second sure uh, <laughs> i'm attached yeah i mean i was going insane and i'm still going insane yeah. uh, but in a weird way it's like a new kind of insane i have sort of found a zen insanity but no i was going insane just like what 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 do you do like so we've had this lovely talk where you hear about all these cool things that I do, right? And I'm doing theater and I'm meeting cool people and I'm doing concerts and I'm, that was fun. That was yeah. great. And that was my life. I was a busy, productive artist, traveling the world, doing what I like, exploring, trying new projects, chasing my dreams, as they say. It ended, it's over. It's like, it, it ain't happening right now. It's really not. And it's, and, <laughs> The first two months, you're like, okay, this sucks, but like, okay. It'll... Then the next two months, then the next two months. And now we're entering the third year of this thing. Luckily, in the fall, I managed to sort of sneak out and do some concerts. That concert in Ottawa was like the perfect little window of opportunity where things actually happen. And I went to Germany a couple times, actually, over the summer and fall. And I did concerts and and surprise, surprise, they were really fun. And <laughs> it's like, wow, I like doing that. So that's great. Um, but so I went insane and I started to, to draw 
and I like I'd never really drawn before. Like I'd never drawn seriously before. Wow. I still I still don't really draw seriously, but I started to draw just like uh, Okay. So so some people are listening to the podcast. So these are fine pencil drawings or are they ink as well? They're this is the pencil kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um wow. And and look, I mean each each page is like that represents a night of trying to not go ins insane. So I would sit there and draw for like six hours. I would I would spend on these drawings. That's really amazing, Josh. So these are from memory or from photos? They're from photographs. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and 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 <laughs> and I filled up about uh, five. <laughs> no, maybe not five, but four, like. These are, wait, that one's not full yet. Oh, that's a new one. I just bought Tempting. a fresh one. <laughs> um, like, these, are you gonna sell these? I don't know what I'm gonna do. So, so like, like all my other passions, yeah. these are it sort of starts off as a hobby, and then maybe it'll lead to something. I don't know. I like. I think yeah, you're really good. Wow. Ce ceci n'est pas un NFT. NF or, I didn't understand that. And you know NFTs, these NFTs, these non-fungible tokens. Oh, you haven't been following the news. <laughs> then I started getting it. Then I started drawing some, some, uh, <laughs> some calligraphy. Yeah. Okay, Beautiful. fine, calligraphy. <laughs> anyway, trying to not go insane. Um, oh, then I did a series of philosophers with food. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's Nietzsche with ceviche, Hume with a shroom. <laughs> Hegel with a bagel. <laughs> okay. Oh, and then doodling. I mean, just constant yeah. sort of these wow. endless doodles. Ay, ay, ay. So, uh, so, whew, trying to not go insane. And it works when I get in, when I get inspired to dig into something like that. That's the best thing. Like when I can just lose myself in a project and forget. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. But that doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some days where you don't want to do any, you don't, you aren't inspired to doodle or to do a portrait. Cause also it's hard. Like, it's like, ugh, this is, I know I'm going to be here for four hours doing this if I want it to be finished and good. So it's like, I don't want to do that today. And then you're depressed for another reason because you haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <laughs> you know, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, I was I was reading a book about um, the flow state and how to be in it mm. more. And there's all these many, many feel good chemicals that are released when we're in flow state. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So there's a real chemistry to it, which is interesting. Big time. And you can't force it. It's magic. It's like, I don't know, maybe your books have methods about how to get into it. But I have not found a, a, like a like a fail safe way to just, OK, you're going to get in the flow state. No way. You've got to just be touched by the muse somehow well i think one thing i i read about which made sense to me as a performer is there's definitely a continuum it's, it's not like a switch it's not like you're in it or you're out of it there's definitely sometimes you're yeah it's like i would say continuum mm. um but you did mention Yitzhak perlman and i mm -hmm. i didn't actually i have not heard that story although his name was floated about your website maybe so. <laughs> okay um it's not the most exciting story i must say of of collaboration just because I mean, he's kind of on a whole other level, maybe in his own mind too, uh, as an artist and as a performer. Um, so, you know, there's that project of him playing Jewish music. Mm -hmm. And one year, it wasn't that long ago, um, Lauren Sklamberg, who is a, an amazing Yiddish singer and accordionist, he, he's, in, he's the lead singer for the Klezmatics. Uh, he is normally in that project. He couldn't do it. So Hankus Netsky, who is another legendary name in the Yiddish music world, who is the musical director of that project, he called me and said, can you come and do, uh, I think it was four concerts, like in the States, come on tour and play with Itzhak Perlman and the band. Uh, wow. Actually, I had another gig that I had to cancel that I hadn't quite confirmed yet in Germany. And I got in a lot of trouble because I said, yo, I have to do this. I've got to go play with Itzhak Perlman. And I did, I learned the repertoire and went and did it. Um, 
but he was kind of in his own little world. I mean, he, he kind of showed up five minutes before the gig and, and rolled on stage and killed it <laughs> and then rolled off stage. And that was it. Yes. We hung out. We ate together several times. Um, just playing with him was thrilling. He is clearly an insanely amazing musician, maybe not as much now as he was at, in his heyday, but boy, oh boy, can he play the fiddle. Um, he's, he's not a master of Jewish violin. That's a different story. And like, I think part of, to me, a bit of a lost opportunity is that because he's so famous and like such a legend, that maybe he wasn't quite open to really digging in and learning about actually playing like quote unquote traditional legitimate klezmer style Yiddish violin, mm -hmm. but he's just such an incredible musician. Like that wasn't the, that wasn't the gig, you know? Um, but the, my most favorite, favorite memory of that whole tour was uh, being backstage one day uh, before the show and I was with Frank London, who's another legend in the scene of, he's the trumpet player. And we were like just jamming and we were just sort of hanging out playing tunes when Itzhak like Perlman came over and started jamming with us. And it was just organic and just like normal musician behavior. <laughs> but that to me is the, the special memory that I'll take away from that experience. Sure. And you worked with Theodore Bikel. Mm -hmm. how, how, how do you say his name? I think it's Bikel. Yeah. Yeah. People say Bikel. Yeah. Oi. And that, I mean, actually, right this minute, I'm trying to learn uh, some lyrics mm -hmm. for a Bikel song. And if you can describe to your listeners, this is like chicken scratch, yeah. uh, <laughs> like, like trying to memorize lyrics. Uh, so I'm trying to learn a Bikel song. I got to work with Theodore Bikel, and now that he's gone, I literally can't believe it. Mm -hmm. The more I learn about him, the more I see what he did, the more I watch on YouTube, like, like because I still kind of look into him now, like, and maybe more than I did when he was alive and I knew him and I worked with him. Mm -hmm. Did <laughs> Was that guy amazing? Like, Okay, he was in the, the African Queen with Humphrey Bogart. He was in the original cast of The Sound of Music. He was the, he was the lead in the original cast on Broadway of The Sound of Music. He was in a movie with Frank Zappa. He was in, he was, he was on uh, Dynasty and The Love Boat. He played Worf's father on, on Star Trek The Next Generation. He was in a movie with Sidney Poitier, like, uh, you know, like just like lately when Sidney Poitier passed away, I was like, huh, I'm going to look up Sidney Poitier in his, in, in Theo's autobiography. And sure enough, he's got a whole in, uh, entry about the, about Sidney Poitier. I mean, he was friends with Odetta and friends with Frank Sinatra and Bob Dylan and, <laughs> and like Steven Spielberg and Mel Brooks and just like literally Hollywood legend. And I worked with him. Mm -hmm. Now I cannot believe it. I'm, I kick myself for not asking him more questions and trying to hang out with him more or something. I mean, I don't know what I should have done. I, but luckily I worked with him. He was in Montreal actually when his wife passed away. Uh, she was an incredible musician. Tamara Brooks was this amazing pianist and, uh, and, and conductor, like a for real conductor of orchestras and she taught conducting at any nec and like just like an amazing like always the most heavy musician in the room whenever you were with her um and she was married to theo and and she, and she had this amazing just like childlike love of him and his genius and i mean he's he was definitely a theatrical genius and like an acting genius like, I mean, he studied with Sir Laurence Olivier and like, I mean, just the whole his, his history is unbelievable. And just getting parts in like these huge productions and just in Hollywood movies. 
but also musically, I'm realizing more and more what a genius he was. I kind of took it for granted. He was this guy with a guitar and he would sing folk songs. Oh my God. You go back and listen to Theodore Bikel recordings. They're just astounding. And, and she would look at him with just this like glee of like, and so to see this heavy classical musician that was with this guy with a guitar and she would look over at the piano, just like in awe of him. I don't think I got it until I'm just starting to get it now of what an insane mm -hmm. genius he was. I, so, so when she passed away, she was much younger than him, but she died before he did, which was oh, super tragic and, and, and super sad for me personally, because she was kind of like an in to him. Like she, she, we were, we got along for some reason, she really accepted me. And so whenever I needed to do something with Theo, I would shoot her an email. I'd say, hey, Tamara, could we do this project? And she'd say, yeah, sure, I'll talk to Theo about it. Mm -hmm. She was kind of like, she was kind of his manager too. Um, but for her to accept me and see what I was doing was cool, was like amazing and, and, and so important for a young musician to get that kind of, that kind of support. When I went to LA once to, to play a show with my like crazy hip hop, like funky Jewish band, they were there. They showed up in the audience. There's Theodore Bikel in the audience. Okay. I invited him on stage. He came and sang a song which became Mein Städte Labels, which we eventually like put on to, on record. Um, but just that kind of support is just invaluable. Like an, an older established musicians, sure they'll come and support something or the no but to really make a, an effort to support people is like like just it's it's amazing so so she passed away and he had a he had a show scheduled in montreal um like of a run of a of a theater piece that he was doing of sholem alechem stories and songs uh and i got a call from theo saying hey Tamara has died, like, but I have this show. Will you be the accompanist? Because oh, wow. she was his accompanist. And so, I mean, I, I didn't want to do it because I was scared. Like, I, I, those were very big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to do it because, like, what an honor and what a, what a fascinating gig it would be to do that. So I accepted it was a super short turnaround too. Like, just like it's in a month, like we got a, re a rehearsal start in a month. So I started learning a repertoire and, and, and boy, I mean, again, life is so weird. Like I can't imagine <laughs> we spent three weeks rehearsing it. You know, I can't remember that. I don't remember that, but I guess that was cool. But, <laughs> but I, I literally cannot remember then we did the show for two or three weeks and that is just something i'll remember as like a feeling like i don't remember the the specifics of it mm -hmm. but just to remember going to the theater to be backstage hanging out with theodore bakel putting on you know him getting made up in the makeup chair um and then just doing a show every day like for two or three weeks that's awesome and that's that's like an experience that happens not as much as it should anymore just that sort of and that's what he had so much of he's mm -hmm. so lucky to have lived in a culture of like theater and and like putting on a show and rehearsals and backstage and so i got a taste of that and i got a taste of that with the master and like we hung out like during the run he came over to my apartment two or three times I have a shitty apartment. Like I have a, it's a hellhole, crappy apartment. <laughs> like it's not pretty. <laughs> and so to have this like 85 year old, like theater legend hanging out, like in this shitty basement apartment, just cause he's cool like that, listening to old records and then like looking through old books together. Unbelievable. Luckily I take a lot of pictures. And so those become my memories. And so I can remember that. Like I have mm -hmm. that fixed in my mind. Um, or just going out to eat with him, like picking him up at his hotel and going out to eat. And, and he, he was voluble with stories and, and just, uh, and songs and melodies and anecdotes and <laughs> wow. And, and it's, and it's sad that the problem with having 90 year old friends is that 
that they do die. They have a tendency to die. <laughs> and so he's gone. And I have so now, now that I'm grown up and I, I have, I have so many more questions I'd like, I'd love to ask him. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you've played many famous halls. I've seen that, that feeling that you described, you know, the hmm. memory of the feeling. Do you feel that about having been at the Apollo or like different, you know, Carnegie hall, different of your, yeah like i mean it's a feeling and yeah. and mem memory is weird isn't it uh i think in fact it's sort of what the fourth season is going to be about is mm -hmm. will be about time and how time has a way of just how it has its way with you and how you can be stuck in time but but it's endless but but it's finite and it's and and these memories it's yeah it's trippy and thank goodness on the one hand i'm grateful for the photographs but on the other hand they're a curse because it sort of becomes all you remember hmm. of a certain thing um but i take I, it's better than not remembering at all so yeah i'm glad <laughs> i took a lot of pictures along the way well i want to thank you for your time today it was just fascinating talking to you my pleasure i i mean i'm glad to meet you and i hope we can hang out in real yeah. life someday yeah. And I want to hear about your journey. I mean, some of the, this interview is, it's cool to, for me to blab about my story and, and, and stuff, but like, actually I, I like to just hang out and <laughs> have a nice yeah. conversation with you someday. 